here. Uh, I'm going to pull, I put together a couple slides just to uh, build on what uh, Ann Louise was saying. So in terms of installing uh, electric vehicle charging stations, I found that there's about three different kinds of charging solutions. First one is what we refer to as networked billing. So an example of this is a charge point where you would have a, a card that, uh, like this little RFID card that the charge point gives out. And you'll find these here in downtown Sarasota, like at the, the ones the county put in at the libraries. They're charge point ones that you have to unlock and charge point allows the option of uh, billing the customer or not. Here in Sarasota County, the ones at the libraries, uh, while they could be, they do not uh, have a fee associated with that. And so you can, and you can find that out if you have a little charge point app that will tell you whether or not that particular station charges you or not. Uh, a restaurant or something might decide to put in one and maybe they charge. A, uh, a parking garage where maybe you pay for parking might decide to put in one that uh, does that. And in most cases, then what you have is a, uh, you have an account with the organization like ChargePoint and you have a credit card on file with them. And if you happen to stop somewhere on the highway and there is a building affiliated with that, uh, it might be by the kilowatt usage, it might be by the hour, maybe they're charging you a couple dollars an hour or something. So it, however they might do it, it'll be charged back to your credit card. The one thing about that, uh, not your internet connection, it's, some, it's uh, actually I was corrected, it could be a cellular connection, but basically when you unlock it, it sends a signal back to the, a home office that says, okay, what's the billing on this? And does this person who's unlocking it, you know, is the credit card still good? Can, you know, are they authorized to move forward with this? Uh, and does the detailed billing, uh, but one thing about it is the organization that installs it pays an annual license fee. So the uh, county, Sarasota County, for these charge point stations they put in, aside from the initial cost of installation, they end up paying charge point an annual license fee. I think Chris was saying it's $600 a year uh, per charging unit for just that connectivity capability. There was also another example of, uh, I think it's called EverCharge, and they've actually started targeting condominiums where they'll come in, and they have the capability where as you add multiple units, the units kind of share information, and as more units start getting plugged in, it, it meters down the, the actual uh, amperage that's going to each car that's being charged. So normally it might take you if you were the only one connected two hours to uh, recharge your car, well, if four cars are connected or 10 cars are connected, it might take you five or six hours because it's, it's what it's doing is it's metering down the, the draw from the main circuit box. And they have an elaborate scheme of, of, of taking the, the uh, electrical usage, charging the uh, owner, I mean the vehicle owner, and then rebating the money back to the condo unit to pay the electric bill. Uh, but the thing about that is there's, after installation, there's ongoing fees associated with that at various levels. So it's, it's, the equipment itself to install is higher cost because it has to have all that connectivity capability and tracking, uh, and there's ongoing uh, annual license fees of some sort, et cetera. Uh, another option is what I refer to as non-networked but locked access here. So it does require some sort of capability and it's, in most cases it's a similar like the card here. It's got a little RFID thing on it and all that does is simply say that the account listed on the card is still valid and it unlocks that station. This is helpful potentially in a condo situation where you want to limit who can have access to that but you don't want to have the ongoing annual cost of uh, the network fees, et cetera. Uh, and again, all it does is uh, allow the person who's holding that card to unlock the station, pull the charging uh, wand out and plug it into the car. Uh, we looked at that and Schneider Electric has one like that. There's other few other manufacturers that will have the RFID access to it. 
third example is uh, non-network open access. This is similar to what the first uh, group of charging stations that the city of Sarasota put in. Uh, Clipper Creek uh, was an example, Palm Avenue Garage, Marina Jack. There you walk up, there's a wand there, you just take it, stick it in the car. Uh, it doesn't know who's using it, uh, there's no extra cost, the equipment is simpler, so it's a uh, lower cost of, of acquisition, and there's no ongoing maintenance fees or anything like that, it's just pure electric usage uh, coming out of that. And so this would be the kind of thing that if a condo wanted to say, hey, this is an amenity, we're not going to try and track who's using it or how much it's used because, you know, in our monthly bill, this is less than 1%, you know, of the monthly bill if we had two of these units put in that was open access. So again, this is where, you know, once condos kind of understand, then they can begin to look at what policies to, to build around that. The other uh, uh, item is, is, okay, once you kind of figure out maybe what type of to do is, is you know, where, where do you put it? So, uh, the, as uh, Ann Luce is pointing out, obviously the, the op op optimal solution is where the charging is where you have assigned space. In most condos, uh, owner, unit owners have an assigned space. If you could have the charging station in some way there, then you have your space and you have your charger, you don't have to let somebody else using it. Uh, and again, it could be the level one or level two, uh, and the, the problem is running conduit to, to that. Uh, in, I'm at 888 Boulevard of the Arts. Uh, we have two towers and they have a parking garage. The underground uh, lower deck is, is covered and it's assigned spaces. Uh, upper deck is open, anyone can use it. So in the assigned spaces, I actually went to the uh, building manager I says, you know, uh, getting a car, you know, what's my options here? We went out and took a look and he says, well, you know, every two, three or four spaces, there's a light uh, there. We could, and it's just a 110 uh, light going, uh, line going to that. We'll have an electrician tap into that, cost $150 to run a line down there, put in a NEMA enclosure. And so I've got a 110 outlet uh, within about five to 10 feet of where I, my parking space is. And actually could probably, I think four spaces probably are within that uh, pluggable range of that, of one, that 110 outlet there. And so that's perfectly viable. Uh, the problem I run into is that uh, while it's, it's not underground, it, it's uh, lower level and at night the lights come on. So they're on a, a, a light sensitive switch. Middle of the day, I can't charge. Uh, so it's good for overnight charging. Um, so that's a, that was a beginning point. So some people, well, how do you get started? Well, that's kind of a easy solution that can get started there. Uh, as mentioned, the centralized with concierge valet. Um, so from an installation, you know, if you do that, then the condo has to look at, okay, what's the shortest run, what's closest to the electrical box, and this is where you have a consultant come out or different, get the different bids. Uh, what I found when in left getting bids, it was better to have a consultant or somebody that kind of looks at where you want to go. You look at the, all the also the, the location that it was pointing out where the uh, uh, cords might be, et cetera, and figure out that and then kind of map that out. And then you go out for bids and say, okay, give us bids based upon, you know, what we've determined to be the optimal location. So you're, you're getting everybody to give you bids based on the same kind of data. Now maybe somebody will come back and say, we can do that for this. Uh, here's another option. So you can always let them do another option to you. Uh, the, obviously the concierge valet is, is that they, you know, you have somebody there that would then rotate the cars around. Uh, if you have a situation where you don't have the valet in the central location, you have the same kind of cost of installing it, the central thing, and then you rely upon the owners to you know, move their cars. One of the nice things I've discovered is that, uh, at least our car fort, and I've talked to other dealers, almost all the cars, when they're fully charged, will send a text message. You, you go into the online account for your uh, car manufacturer, or charge point even, and it sends you a text message. So I can be up in my unit and I get a, a little text message and it says, your car's fully charged. Okay, so if I was in a shared space, I'd say, Okay, well, in the next half hour, I should go down and move the car. And yes, you have to rely upon courtesy. You can try and set a, 
uh, an owner's agreement, uh, those who are there, hey, within half an hour, if you would, please move your cars. If somebody becomes a chronic abuser, well, you try and, and deal with that. Okay. Yeah. My name is Ray. For your car, and I'll show you this is a very basic question. For your car as a hybrid, you could run that car without ever charging the fuel. I could. It's, it's less expensive to so run it on electricity, um, and, I, and I prefer that. Now, one of the options I'm not showing up here, and it was how I justified buying my car to begin with, is I'm, like I say, right across the bay there, and I'm in the downtown area, and I convinced my wife, I said, look at this, you know, there are 15 level two charging stations within three miles, you know, in downtown area, uh, five or six within one mile. We like to go for a morning walk, you know, gee, I'll get up and drive the car, plug it in, and then we walk back home. And then when it's ready, I'll walk back there. So we get our, we get our walk in, uh, you know, walk into the Palm Avenue garage. Uh, or as pointed out, you know, hey, we're gonna go out for dinner. Why don't we park at the Palm Avenue garage or now at the State Street garage, we plug in. Within two, three blocks, there's umpteen restaurants and we eat there. So it's a convenient factor. So we appreciate the fact that the city has put in these free charging stations. So that's, you know, another option. I know one of the other condo owners in our building, we were having this discussion and he says, I'm gonna buy a BMW uh, i3, goes 80 miles. He says, I don't need to charge in the condo because uh, they have two cars. And so it's just used for city driving. So we might go a week before I use up that 80 mile. So I go park at the parking garage, walk over to the gym and then work out and come back or go have dinner and come back. And so he's relying strictly on city charging uh, to do that until such time as we get, it's, it is obviously more convenient if we can do it out of condo. So being in the downtown area, there are some conveniences. Some of the downtown condos can simply say, you know, park your car at the garage and um, don't worry about it for right now. But there, there certainly is a convenience of, of having it within your building, having your park in there where it's in your enclosed area uh, for that. Uh, the other question was asked about the cost. So this is just an example. This is from about uh, nine months ago. We did go through a process. Our condo association has not signed off on this yet, but I worked with the building manager to at least come up with some cost to go to the, uh, the board of directors with. So we looked at those various options and said, we think that the, the, the level two non-network would probably be the best fit for our condo association there. The idea of having the RFID card would allow the office, the, the, the property manager office, to basically hand out the cards. So that way we, we could restrict it so it would only be used by those people who have done it. The suggestion was that we would have a uh, an owner's um, uh, not warranty but a liability sign up, when they sign up for it, they're also signing a, a paragraph that says, we hold the condo association harmless if anything happens to our car uh, for that. So you, you get somebody to sign that they agree to a certain set of principles or rules too. So they have to sign and then they're assigned the number and the, and the card for that. So that way we thought, well, at least you could limit it. Uh, the other thing that was with that is then it's, we're not metering so we don't know what the usage of is, but as Ann Louise was pointing out, it's really a small amount. Uh, I know from just using the level one plug-in, I, I bought a little, uh, what's called a kilowatt uh, meter that sits on the end that plugs into the wall. And so I've been tracking the usage and typically it's running about uh, six, seven dollars a month. And so I write the condo a check or whatever it is every quarter, you know, uh, 15, $20 a quarter is really is the usage uh, for that. Somebody else said, well, gee, maybe it's $10 a month. So, okay, you're fine. Somebody signs up, they're, they'll, be, uh, they'll agree to pay the condo $10 a month, whatever you want to set as a fee. If the condo says, well, gee, we want to recoup the cost of installation, then set it at 25 or, or whatever amount per month and you can recoup that back. Uh, the nice thing about that is, is if somebody doesn't pay, well, you go out there with a little uh, handheld programmer and you deprogram their number. So when they go up there, it's no longer unlocking it there. So you have to have control over the usage of that. So that was the idea of that. 
and basically it was thirty five hundred dollars upfront cost. We went out and got bids from uh, different electricians. They said, "Yeah, you got to add the uh, uh, breakers there and the panel and run the in, uh, the cable installation." And we got bids anywhere from three to five thousand for that. So we said, "You know, net there." Uh, Six thousand sixty-five hundred dollars, and uh, it turned out that uh, basically, while it in condo language it could be considered a material alteration or a significant addition, which in most people's, if you've ever looked at your condo rules, there's usually rules about uh, those kinds of additions and whether it requires an owner vote across all owners. Uh, in our condo, anything under ten thousand, the board can approve of a material alteration or significant addition. So I said, it's well within the uh, board level limits. So that was what Anne Louise was referring to is, yeah, uh, who has to sign off on this uh, for that? And so this was the example of, okay, because it's, it's an amenity that enhances the value of the condo complex. Therefore, the argument was that the condominium should pay for that. They could decide to recoup that cost through the fee charge but then just use the, uh, have each owner agree to pay so much a month, and that way they can change that over time. So this was the example of uh, one, one thing. Again, every condo complex has got different configurations, so you're gonna find you have different needs. If you have condo unit owners who are wanting to put in, uh, you have multiple owners with Teslas, you know, another example is you put in one of the Tesla charging uh, stations, and. If you actually, when you go back outside here, uh, as you are standing at the moat and facing back to the parking lot on the right hand side, there is a Tesla charging unit over there. And it's still a, a uh, 240, but it has a higher wattage. I think it's 50 watt uh, there because the Tesla cars themselves uh, can take a, a faster charge uh, that way. So depending upon how many owners and what type of vehicle they have, you may find that, well, gee, you got a bunch of owners, maybe you put in one of the Tesla charging units and a dual 240 non-Tesla uh, charging unit. So those, those are some of the options there in every configuration uh, to do that. Uh, Chris Shar, who's here earlier, is a consultant to go out and meet with that. He and I had talked to the folks over at 1350 Maine. They're kind of trying to look okay, and we've actually walked around Panels are over, behind over here in this room. What's the closest available open, non-assigned parking space nearest that? And those are the kinds of, of questions you get into just in terms of the physicality of where can you tap in? Is there enough extra panel breaker space amperage available? Or do you have to go and add a uh, add-on panel or something like that? So uh, anyway, questions? So you, since this is your private residence, so you're trying to get this a lot of the legwork. What if you have an idea for somewhere that you think would be a good place for a charger? Who do you tell or what steps do you take so that you're not doing all of this stuff for like a public place? Like, you know, if you, you think you have a parking lot in mind, like who do you tell? Who do you share lot? your idea with? You mean in a condo or? No, or and just anywhere in the city. Like you uh, talked about how in the city you have in a parking garage, can we get a charger? here, and you're asking your condo, can we get here? Yeah. Who does someone ask that question to if it's not a condo board, or if it's not? Well, typically it would be whoever owns that property. Okay. You know, they're, they're the ones who, you know, owns the property, so it's just something that has to be physically installed in that property, plus that property owner is the one that has the contract with FPL for elected usage. Mm -hmm. um, and that was where an example of a restaurant decided either on their own or because of some regulation to put in a charging station there. As a consumer, you know, you can bring it up and mention it to them that, hey, uh, that we come here often. Yeah, like I was saying, like a public parking lot, like who decides that particular public, is it the public's corporation, is it someone from the city? I'm just curious. Oh, I mean, it would be the landowner, typically. Okay. So it's not a owner's property, say. Okay, okay, that's nice. Yeah. But Culver's maybe that to my knowledge in Bradenton, um, there is no requirement that from the city of Bradenton or even from Harrison County. I've never heard that. Yeah, my guess is is probably Culver's on all of their locations probably wants to do that. 
Yeah, the corporation could have said we could do it. It's a marketing tool for sure. businesses. Yeah, I mean, to me, I, I haven't gone talk to them, but it would seem like Cracker Barrel, you know, which makes their brand by being the place you get off the interstate to go to, and they have all that stuff to shop, so they want you to stay there and rest. To me, you put in charging stations so people will stay there a couple hours and while they're sitting there, they order, oh, well, let's have dessert because we got to wait till it's fully charged, you know, kind of like Chris's thing about the more time you have, the more things you want to buy, you know, or gee, we got to wait another 15 minutes for the car to fully charge up, so let's look around the shop here and buy some more. You know, to me, it's, it's a good, savvy business owner is going to say, it's going to attract people. I know uh, a year ago when the UTC Mall first opened, I was out there the first week and was looking around. And as uh, Larry had mentioned, they got 16 charging stations, eight on each side, on the east and west side of the mall there. And I was out there, I went and plugged one in, and it, or I, I used my charge point and it didn't unlock. And so I was looking at it and there was a, a guy walking by, I had a shirt on from the, the whatever the mall management company was. So you have any problem? I said, yeah, yeah, this thing's not working. He said, well, let's try this one over here. I did. So then we started talking. I said, Okay, uh, these are free, right? He says, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I says, you guys are ever gonna charge? He says, no, no, we want to in, you know, attract people. This is part of our marketing. You know, This is the amenities, you know? We have free Wi-Fi inside. So it's, it's part of amenities that bring customers to their location. So, yeah. That's still that. destination charging, and if Tesla has some type of charger, it, it gives it a way to get suitable destinations, usually hotels, mm -hmm. places like that, or some other place. It will give the destination that charge for free. The destination has to install it and pay for the ongoing electricity. Okay. But, uh, and believe it or not, that's a hard sell. Because <laughs> even if you're giving the charge for charge, you can't put it anywhere. One uh, comment to the EV owners in the room, though. Um, you had mentioned public. Um, I've been on some of corporate publics about charging put charging in certain stores as a pilot and EV owners have ruined it for everybody because in some of their current stores they will watch somebody come up plug in and disappear and not even go in their store so I would urge any EV owners in this room to actually be good citizens and be customers of the locations that you're using because they're aware of whether you are a customer my only my only personal experience in Publix is the one here on Bee Ridge, and uh, when they first opened, it was free. I went down, and uh, we did go to Publix. And not that I needed a charge, but I did go to, to Publix. But so, subsequently, I think they handed it over to a, uh, uh, a firm that actually deals in charging, you know, charging battery chargers, not to get rid of car or something or other. Car charging. Car charging. And uh, they're very expensive right now, even, you know, way more than that. And our residential rates, and uh, and I also hear a lot of complaints about it. It's not kept up. That the, the charges are not even working. So it, it sounds like it's something that, like you said, they've tried and then they kind of like they, yeah. they've shrugged. 